Amen. It's great to be in the Lord's house today, and we're glad that each one of you are here. We'd like to welcome you here, those in the room, those in the parking lot, and those at home on Facebook. We are so excited for each one of you to be together with us in worship this morning. We're going to begin our worship service by reading a psalm in just a moment, Psalm 103. Uh, very much on my heart uh, this week because this week we have uh, been a part of the celebration of life of several in our church. Last Sunday, uh, Sister Brenda Regner's brother-in-law, uh, they had his service as he had gone home to be with the Lord and uh, we're still grieving with them. And then on Monday, Sister Helen Hammond Davis, who's here today with us, her dad went home to be with Jesus, and we celebrated his home going. And then later in the week, we had the passing of one of our church members, Sister Gail Shook. And so Sister Gail loved Jesus, and she went home to be with him after a battle with cancer. And at her funeral, her family had given me a list of uh, some things about her, specifically about how she loved the Word and her favorite passage of scripture is Psalm 103, and I just couldn't get that out of my mind this week. And so I want to begin today as we think about the homegoing of saints of God, uh, many that we have celebrated this year in 2020 as it ended in 2021, will no doubt uh, carry others home to be with Jesus, and we're going to celebrate that and to say with those, even those who grieve, these very words, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We live long enough, and we realize that our bodies and our Emotions and sometimes our attitudes age a little bit. But the Bible tells us that God can renew us and does renew us. And we want to bless him as he puts within us a spirit of renewal. Even in 2021, uh, we want to ask him for revival in each of our hearts. So let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer this morning. Brother Heath, would you lead us please? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, may we just come today to come into your house to worship you and just to praise your mighty name. And Lord, that may we continually remember to praise you. And Lord, especially as we start a new year, may this not be a time that we make a resolution that doesn't mean anything, but Lord, this, may this be a time that we focus continually on you and every day focus on you more and more. And Lord, we pray that you just continue to work in our life. And Lord, we pray that you be with us through this service. Lord, we pray that you just speak to each and every one of us. And Lord, just draw us all closer to you. Lord, these things we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Thank you for that song. Thank you for all the songs this morning. He's working on our hearts. He's here. He's turning lives around. That's who he is. That's what he does. That's what he's up to. In 2020, he was up to that. And in 2021, that's what Jesus is doing. He's here this morning to do that in you and us. Whether or not we're here in this room or in that parking lot, right outside these walls or all the way around the world beside a, a computer screen watching, the Lord is there. And we are aware of that. In January of 2020, we started a series and continued on with looking with a 2020 vision through God's eyes and what he had for us. And today we're going to, at least for a while longer, look with 2020 hindsight looking backwards to help us look forward to the future, to see what we can acknowledge that we've learned and that God is showing us continually. We're still in Matthew's gospel in chapter 15. If you'll be finding that, you will remember, no doubt, last week we were together in, in God's word and we saw that people were healed. If they just had a little faith in a big God, they could reach out and just touch the tassels on the edge of his robe, and there was enough power in Jesus that just through dangling fringe of cloth and faith that Jesus could do it, people's lives were changed just through that smallest kind of outreach in chapter 14. And then in the evening service, we saw that there were those who sought to simply spend their lives as spectators, commentators, authorities, critics, if you will. Now, I know if we have some 2020 hindsight, we ought to be able to look behind us and see that it's been the year of commentators. It's been the year of critics and cynics. It's been the year of spectating and commenting on things ad nauseum until we, we just think there can't be any more of it, and then there's someone else who is a self-proclaimed expert. I'm not here today to be one more of those. I'm not seeking to be a critic of your life nor your lifestyle. We come to God's house each week and on Sunday morning, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights, try to faithfully open God's Word and say, this is what God's Word says, and this is what it shows us. And last Sunday night as we opened the text, we saw that it showed us some, some critics, some commentators. In verse 1, there were some scribes and Pharisees that came from Jerusalem not to get in on the healing, Jesus had just healed everybody, pretty much. And you'd think people would be excited about that or want to be a, a part of it, but these people wanted to have an opinion about it. Many people have an opinion on many things. Most of the time, we're wrong. Specifically, opinions tend to be critical. In verse 2, we see that that was the heart of these men, scribes and Pharisees, seeking to be critical of Jesus and his disciples and very specifically, their accusation and their problem was with hand washing and the tradition that it broke. It's not really about cleanliness, by the way, and we will reference a lot of what we've been through with the pandemic this morning, and we just can't avoid it almost any week. And I never want you to think that I'm being flippant about health and welfare. I've got my little mask here. I'll put it on at the conclusion of the service. I try to wash my hands very vigorously and regularly and keep my distance. I'm better at keeping my distance from most of you than most of you are keeping your distance from me. I'm aware of those things and I take those things seriously and, and we care about our own health. We care about your health. But this is a year with 2020 hindsight looking backwards where we can begin to acknowledge some things about some of this kind of stuff that because of traditions, because of maybe welfare issues in our own mind for others or ourselves. These guys were, were all wrapped up in hand washing to the point of they missed the fact that Jesus had just healed people and changed their life. And so Jesus began to teach about that and he pointed his righteous finger in their unrighteous noses essentially and said, you think you know all about what's right. You care more about tradition. You care about, more about ritual. I care about a relationship and one of my laws is that you would honor your father and mother. And 
They're sitting there, well, sure we've done that. He said, but what you actually do is when your father and mother convalesce and get older and they need help or they need your assistance in paying a rent or buying some milk or bread, uh, you just say you gave their part to the Lord and walk off and leave them. That's, that's what Jesus told these men. You found a way to feel religiously good even though you are relationally broken with even your relatives. And what we know is Jesus is not asking these men nor you to honor God and forsake our family in that way. We are to take care of our family and honor God, all in our stewardship, all at the same time. And he calls them in verse 7 hypocrites and said that Isaiah prophesied about them and, and began to make a line that we want to build on today out of God's word that there's a difference in what's on the outside of us, though it may be important in some ways, and what's on the inside of us, and it's what's on the inside that is most important. He said that these people draw near me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship, and they teach as doctrines what men say. By the way, be here tonight because we're going to hear about a lady who comes to Jesus who was not a Jew and had no standing in Israel, but she begged him and worshipped him, and God heard her. We'll preach more about that tonight. These guys had standing. They were, they were responsible religious people, and they claimed to worship him, but their worship was false. Let's stand to our feet as we pick up our story and read out of Matthew 15, and we're going to begin in verse 12. As Jesus has just chastised these men for their critical spirit, and we want to gain an understanding about the unwashed this morning. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And Jesus answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. And Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man? For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that this morning you would make your word alive in our hearts. Lord, that it would bear a harvest of fruit spiritually today. We pray for those that do not know you and are separated from their knowledge of you by sin in their heart. Lord, that you would address that, convict them, convince them of your righteousness and your willingness to change their life forever. And God, we pray that someone would be eternally saved this morning. Lord, we ask you to touch the hearts of your Christian people, those who ought to understand but have failed or ceased to understand this morning. God, that you would give us a 2020 hindsight to see in our own lives our own shortcomings. And Lord, that we would ask you for forgiveness and change in a new year. According to your power, it work within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. I believe if we'll open our hearts and minds in 2021, we will find a clarity given to us by Jesus concerning the true nature of clean living. I don't really know anybody that just says, I want to be dirty. <laughs> I want to stay dirty. Now, we go through life, we get dirty, we're involved in things that are dirty. I live on a farm, I, there's dirt out there. I come home, my wife's like, stay out there, you know. I'm surprised you hadn't bought a fire hose and just <laughs> hosed me down out in the yard. I'll, anyway, we, we all are aware that, that dirt is in the world. It gets on us. It seems to be an exterior reality. We, in a pandemic year, have been very familiarized with kinds of sanitation and protocols and products and different kinds of masks and different kinds of, of, of detergents. And I've 
talk to school teachers and there are so many squirts on the table and so many times they scrub and wash and all sorts of procedures that are supposed to help us and products that are supposed to help us. But what we see here today is that Jesus is the one that will give us clarity concerning the true nature of how to live a clean life. Number one, many people right now certainly have a heightened sensitivity concerning proper washing. How do we wash our hands? How do we clean our tables as teachers? How do we keep our distance in a room? How do we conduct ourselves? What will be good for our health? And those are great things. But have we thought this year, if we look back at 2020, how much time did we really spend thinking about what would be good for our spiritual health? What would keep us right in the sight of God? What would keep us right in our relationship with our spouse or our children or our neighbors or our co-workers, our fellow man? What would make our life a more pure, clean witness to others who are lost and undone and on their way to an eternal hell? How could we be truly clean in a way that other people could see? Number two, many people have been left uprooted and upended while proceeding in their own perspective. See, these scribes and Pharisees came from Jerusalem to be critics and commentators on the way it was being done wrong. And they had a right way to do it this way and you'll be all right. Nobody may get saved. Nobody's life will change. Nobody will be healed. But at least you'll be traditionally and culturally clean. And let me tell you, it's a very careful line we must tread as a church and as Christian people about caring too much about what the world says about us fitting into their mold <laughs> to the point we can't say anything at all about what we all must do to fit into God's plan. And with 2020 hindsight, if we'll look around, we, I think, must admit that it at least seems like the church in America and the world in 2020 spent more time trying to figure out a way how we could be culturally accepted in the norms and the standards and new procedures of cleanliness rather than being concerned with the priority of God's plan being preached to a lost and dying world who are in the greatest danger ever in their whole entire life because we feel like we must pay homage to the tradition of men and the commandments taught to us by men. So what's the danger of that? Jesus gave us two great clear illustrations. One is that of a plant that was in the soil and seemed to grow and seemed to be great and wonderful. And another of two people on a journey holding one another by the hand and one of them leading, the other one following. It's like, well, those are pretty wonderful little emblems in our brain, symbols of progress, a plant coming out of the ground and one person leading another person. That'd be great. You could like silhouette that and you could probably embroider it on your lapel and somebody think you're a part of a great club. You're the tree sprouting group or, or you're the leadership group. But the problem is, if you look closely at Jesus' story, what he says is this plant, at a time someone comes and grabs it, plucks it out of the ground Shakes it real hard because you don't want to waste any dirt on a weed. You just shake that thing and then throw it away. Some of y'all are gardeners. If you go to your garden, you may have a little pile over, over there in the side or maybe it's in your wheelbarrow. My grandfather, Lee Hunt, was a farmer and he waged a lifetime war against sticker weeds. I've shared that before. And what he would do with a, a mattock and a shovel is he would break it over and there's a way to do it. I, anyway, you get down there and you got to get the tap root and get it out and shake the dirt off of it pick up any leaf or root get it and you put it in a feed sack or a salt bag and you roll that up and you go burn it in an incinerator and ask the priest to pray over it and it'll never come back now some is is like a big thing you had to do all that because you want to get rid of this junk you got to get it up by the root and jesus says of the scribes and the Pharisees and their kind of cleanliness is just going to be plucked up, shook off, and thrown away. <laughs> and he said also it's like a blind leading a blind person. Now you got to think about that. One blind person's out there and they're groping and they can't see the way forward and they know they want to go forward. They know they're not where they need to be. They want to progress like I think most lost people. I think God puts a lostness and awareness in people's lives, a, a God-sized hole if you would. And somebody says, I need help. But the problem is, is there's another blind person out there and they are sure they can see. 
And, and they say, I can help you. And, and see, the one blind person doesn't know the other blind person is blind. And so the second blind person just runs and grabs the person by the hand. Follow me. And they're okay, somebody's willing to help me. And so they take off on this journey. And the first person's feeling pretty good because now they got somebody leading them. That's what they wanted. A whole lot of people in the world looking for somebody to lead. Who will help me? Who will blaze a trail? Who will set a pace? Who will go forward with me? And somebody's other says, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And, and Jesus says, it's like a blind person leading a blind person. And before you know it, the one blind person who knows they're blind is leading a blind person who may not know they're being led by a blind person. And they both end up in a ditch, upended together. Many people are going to be uprooted. If we look back in 2020, many people have been uprooted and upended by these worldly attitudes and these convincing stories of, I know what we need to do. How many times in 2020 did somebody tell us, this is the thing to do? Only next week, that same person might say, now this is the thing to do. Or maybe a different person saying about that person that that was not the thing to do. And till all of our heads just spin. And the reality is, Concerning things like pandemics, nobody really knows for sure all of the right things to do. I'm not saying they don't know any of the right things to do, but it's hard. <laughs> it's the blind leading the blind. We're all blinded. We're human. We are frail. We are prone to failure. But yet we've had a year where the proclaim, the proclamation of I know, I'm in charge, follow me, has been repeated and contradicted and then repeated and contradicted to the point that it's hard for any of us really sometimes to know which ends up or which is the common wisdom of today. Well, let me help you a little bit. Number three, we don't want to talk just about what people say, but what does Jesus say? Jesus taught his disciples that the physical realities of this world do not have ultimate importance. Again, if you walk away from today's sermon saying the preacher said, doesn't matter if you wash your hands, doesn't matter if you wear a mask, that's not what the preacher's saying. What the preacher's saying is what Jesus said, and that is this. The physical realities of this world do not have ultimate authority and importance in our lives. We are made by God for eternity. You get that? We're not made by God for this simple temporal existence there's an eternal soul that God has put in you and designs and desires for you to live for eternity and we cannot therefore put all of our import and all of our attention on just what we're doing for this moment and right now and the and for the perpetuation of that which by nature will not last forever so what do you mean by that well look at verse 17 Jesus has been preaching to the scribes and talking about the scribes and the Pharisees and their messed up view of tradition and, and life and importance. And then Peter chimes in, verse 15, we don't get it, Jesus. And then verse 16, Jesus says, and you don't get it either? So it's not just that blind and lost people don't get it, but sometimes those who are supposed to see still don't get it. So if you're here today and you're struggling with 2020 and even in hindsight, good, we, we all struggle to make it make sense. And so verse 17, Jesus says this. Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? Now, let me be clear and let me be sensitive by saying this. If you will put on your adult goggles and read that passage of Scripture and say, what did Jesus just say? Jesus just said exactly what you think he just said. When you go to Christmas Eve or Christmas, and you gobble up a bunch of really good food, and it's the best food ever. I've never had any food better than this food. Or New Year's Eve, and you ate uh, black-eyed peas and turnip greens or fat bat or pork back or pork chops or whatever it was you had. Man, this is good. This is so good. It makes me want to slap my mama. It's a country phrase. Best there's ever been. In just a little while, you're not going to have access to that anymore. The Greek word for eliminated means just exactly what you think it means. 
the old timey phrase would be means we go to the outhouse. That's what it would say. That's the Greek word for eliminated. That's really what it says. So for a little while, we take stuff into us, and then what we took into us is no more in us. And we put a lot of time and thought into this us, the us that is material. And what Jesus says is all that part of us is here, and it's gone. It's no more. It's a process that's taking place. You're going to be born. You're going to live. Can I tell you something with love? You're going to die unless Jesus comes back first. I'm not being hard. I'm not being a smart aleck. I'm not being a cynic. With all the love in the pastor's heart, I can tell you, is I've been around more funerals than probably most of y'all. And I, we could probably like add most of y'all together, or at least half y'all together, and I've still been around more death. So I'm not saying that as, as a smart aleck. What I'm just saying is I know what Jesus is talking about. The births and the birthdays and the Christmases and the New Year's and the resolutions and all the time and all the holidays and all the vacations and all the fun and all the trophies and you can put it all together and one day it will pass away. We put it down. It is separated from us. Now the good news is that's not the real you. The real you is made for something better than that. The real you never dies. But if Christians live in such a way as to validate the wrong truth and the wrong existence about what true cleanliness is, is we place all of our emphasis and all of our time and all of our effort and all of our money on this part of us, then we're in trouble. Because Jesus taught that the true reality was inside, in our heart. The word that he uses to differentiate, some of you are familiar with when Jesus called people to, together to him and together with one another, he used a word koinonia, which is, which is a fellowship, a, a kindredness. Well, there's a word that appears a couple times in verse 18, and then one time in verse 18, one time in verse 19, talks about being defiled. It's a very similar root word in the Greek language, koinoo which means to profane, to make common, to dilute, and to put away. And so there's a knowing of Christ that brings us to him and to others. And then there's a state of being in us that brings us away from Christ and away from others. And he says that doesn't have to do with how you wash your hands. It doesn't have to do with whether or not you have a germ or you smell. It's not what it's about. The thing that is most important about your life is the cleanliness of your heart. And by that, I don't mean the organ that's beating inside of you right now. It is that spiritual soul that each one of us has. Are you still without understanding? Whatever comes into us, exterior things, those are just exterior things. It's just stuff. It's a material world. There are chemical reactions. There are biological processes, and those things are taking place. They're taking place in Christians. They're taking place in lost people. They've been taking place for 2,000 years and 2,000 before that and 2,000 before that. They'll be coming and taking place until the Lord comes back. Those processes are at work. But inside of each and every one of us, there's a living, eternal soul, immortal before God because he's blessed us with that image of Christ, that Imago Dei, that is in every one of us, that no animal, that no rock, no mountain, no beautiful seashore, nothing has that except for you. And you're so important that he says, we better pay attention to that thing. It's our heart. And the things that are in our heart that come out of us are the things that show where we stand with Jesus. At this time of the year, around New Year's, I get sentimental. I'm one of those old guys. I tell the same stories again. I'm getting older and more bald all the time. Sometimes people talk about how gray they are. Somebody was telling me how gray they are the other day, and I said, I'd just rather be gray, but I'm going bald. So I'm, I, I'd trade grayness any day for baldness. But losing more and more hair, telling more and more of the same stories over and over. One of those is how I grew up. In church, and I'm excited about that. I'll never 
be reluctant to say, I grew up in church, and we had a tradition at New Year's, New Year's Eve, the church I grew up in had New Year's Eve singings, or singings, that's what we would say, we don't have a New Year's Eve singing, and I don't remember what time they started, I just remember as a kid, you got to stay up to midnight, and that was going to be awesome. And I remember the best part of it is we'd be having a singing, and we somewhere in there before midnight, we'd take a break and have food, and that was always what we were looking forward to. We were looking forward to the food part, and then the midnight part, and then we get normally go spend a night with a, a cousin, or they go spend a night with us, and we, so we'd have a, a big old time. And the next day, we'd wake up and light firecrackers and foam at one another. Now, I don't, you can cut that part out of the, the internet feed, and none of you young people Brock, don't repeat that. Then I said we threw firecrackers at one another. But uh, we, we were reprobate, okay? We were defiled. We were unrepentant children at times. But I remember enjoying those New Year's Eve singings, and I remember those old songs. And as I was thinking about this and, and our heart, I, I started singing and humming an old song in my mind that I hadn't heard sung in a long time. Is thy heart right with God? Have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Dost thou count all things for Jesus but loss? Is thy heart right with God? Hast thou dominion over self and over sin? Is thy heart right with God? Over all evil without and within, is thy heart right with God? Is there now no more condemnation for sin? Is thy heart right with God? Does Jesus rule the temple that was in, is within? Is thy heart right with God? Are all thy powers under Jesus' control? Is thy heart right with God? Does he each moment abide in your soul? Is thy heart right with God? There was a chorus that went like this. Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, is thy heart right with God? That's a good old hymn. Ask us some good questions at the end of one new year, an old year, the beginning of a new year. Are we right with God? Have we been cleansed? Have we been made holy? You say, well, I, I, I don't know if I need that. You do because Jesus taught us that these realities were evident in our life that our unwashed heart is the, t is the source of all kinds of different sin. Our hearts need washing. I was talking a moment ago about coming in from the pasture or the farm and, and, and you say, well, I don't ever have that kind of dirt. Well, you may have a different kind of dirt. So it don't matter what your dirt smells like or what my dirt looks like or his dirt smells like. Dirt's dirt. Uncleanness is uncleanness. And it's not about the exterior, it's about the interior. And so Jesus, if you didn't think it was polite what he said earlier about eliminating this food on the inside, hear what he says about what's on the real inside of us in our hearts. It's even a more gross list. For out of the heart proceeds what? Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and blasphemy. Well, there's a list to try to get over in 2021. Somebody says, well, I, don't, I didn't have any of that in me in 2020. Well, let's be careful. Let's make sure our 2020 hindsight really covers it all, that we go back and look. I know if we look at our world, we can find many people who spent a lot of time with evil discussion in 2020. There were Several political races going on. A lot of people talking evil about a lot of people. Some still going on. I don't know what they're going to advertise on my YouTube feeds when, when the pol pol political elections end, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So much evil discussion, murder, and, and slaughter. I, I looked it up between services because it came to my mind. I had not looked it up earlier. A new report by the Council on, on Criminal Justice has found that homicide in the United States was up by around 36% in 2020. That's a 2020 hindsight we'd like to not see. And by the way, some people have said to you politically, oh, that's only in one color state or one color city, red states, blue states, red cities, blue cities. There was less than half a percent difference 
in blue cities and red cities in the homicide rate. Unless you think your political party sometime, somehow has made a difference in this world and the brokenness of our hearts. The world we live in is fallen. The year we've gone through has been difficult, but the year we're facing is also going to be difficult because there's still a fallen world out there. The good news is God is bigger than all of it in any year and in every generation. We as God's people have an opportunity to be honest with ourselves. We keep using this book, which some people try to use this book as a magnifying glass to hold up to other people. Look at Delilah and her sin, it gets bigger to me. And I look at Heath and his gets bigger to me. And if I look at you through that magnifying glass, your sin just gets bigger. So the Bible says the, that it is not a magnifying glass for your sin in my eyes. It is a, is a mirror for my sin to see me how God sees me. So, so let's look at ourselves in 2021 and see what our 2020 looked like with our evil discussion, with our murder, with murderous tongues. You say, I didn't kill anybody. How many people did you kill with your tongue? Our adultery, our fornication, our thefts, our false witness, our blasphemy and slanderous speech. All these could be worthy of an entire sermon all by themselves, but nobody show up after week one. <laughs> I'm not coming back. Next week's murder. Next week's adultery. Next week's fornication. How about let's just we skip to the last one: blasphemy and slanderous speech. I don't know how to gauge what a record would be like, but I don't know if there's ever been a year with 2020 hindsight looking backwards where the church in America or the church around the world has said the right things about the wrong entities and the wrong things about the right entities as much as they did in 2020. Ascribing to a government or ascribing to a hospital or ascribing to a medical profession the things that only belong to God. Ascribing to an economy or to an employment or to a stimulus check the expectation that only belongs to God is blasphemy. I'm not saying medicine is not important or health care is not important or your economy is not important. But the Bible says the most important thing in our lives is God and our relationship to him. And yet Christians and churches around the world have bowed their knee continually in 2020. With hindsight, we can say for sure to say that the most important thing is something else. We have not focused the way we should and the way we must in 2021 on the sufficiency of Jesus Christ for us to be who he's called us to be, who he empowers us to be, clean-hearted people. And change us on the inside. So I believe we've had not only record murders in 2020, I think we've had record blasphemy in 2020. No one can judge it but the Lord. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what everybody else did. The question is, what did you do? Where did you place your greatest faith? Where have you placed your greatest expectation and greatest trust? On what accomplishments have you placed your greatest accolades in 2020? With hindsight, often we must say we put too much of it in the government, too much of it in the economy, too much money, uh, too much of it in, in our finances, too much of it in our physicians, too much of it in our pharmacies, too much of it everywhere except for the expectation that Jesus is the one that can keep us clean. We as God's people must be different in 2021. Jesus taught us that the unwashed heart is the source of all types of sin. Yes, you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, Jesus taught us that it's the unwashed heart that will ultimately defile you. That ultimate verdict on your life will not be what illnesses you suffered with in this world. Listen to me because we're almost done. And I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but I would like to get your attention. I don't know of anywhere in Scripture where we're ever even hinted at the fact that when we stand before God in eternity that He is going to care one iota about how we died. Now we know that Jesus doesn't want us to be murdered. He said that. He doesn't want us to take our own life. He says that. He doesn't want us to 
die as a result of our own sinful lifestyles. Do not misunderstand what I'm saying. But our acceptance by God in eternity will not say, well, now let me see. It says right here, you died of high blood pressure. That is not on the covered list. Well, now, well, let me say right here, it says you, you died of cancer. Now, we, we don't cover cancer in heaven. We, we don't have a policy for you. This is a oh, car, car wreck, okay. I've been a pastor for over 26 years. I've had the privilege, the great privilege of standing and presiding at funerals and celebrating God's grace in terrible times over the coffins of people from, I think, 104 years old, if I remember the age of the oldest funeral that I ever did. That was amazing. And everything in between, all the way to standing and presiding over the funeral of a preborn, stillborn child. And every age in between. All kinds of illnesses. Some that came suddenly and without expectation and some that were long and treacherous and hard for families to go through. I've never stood at someone's casket who died of a disease or an illness where, where they were ever turned away from a hospital and the hospital says, we don't love you, we don't care, you go away. Never stood over a casket where someone was passed by and, and the ambulance wouldn't stop. No one whose, whose loved ones just said, we don't care about you, we will not sit by your bedside. Every person has been loved on this earth and cared for by our government, and ministered to by our health care systems, but everyone, yes, still deceased from this life. In a physical reality, gone. But an eternal reality, still alive. Somewhere. Now my great privilege as a pastor is knowing that most all of those were people that we knew died by faith, serving Jesus. Knowing him and loving him. Being told, well done. You've been faithful over just a little bit. Come on in. But listen. In 2020, the church is tragically close with hindsight. Of painting some sort of grim, ridiculous notion. That there are some kinds of death that are more or less consequential than other kinds of, of death. Some kinds of verdict of God in eternity that will be different based on how we died. And the reality is there is no evidence of that anywhere in Scripture. Our world and families do the best they can for all they can all the time. And we should. But here's the reality. Eternity's coming for all of us. And we will not be given a verdict from God's great throne based on how we died in the physical. But we will be given a verdict from God's great throne based on how we died spiritually. Did you die with defilement, separated from God? Because of sin in your heart, unatoned for, unapologetic, unconfessed, unwashed. See, these men came from Jer Jerusalem to Jesus. You're not doing it right. And all they were worried about was the outside. And the outside's going away for everybody. And Jesus says, it's what's in here. That's coming out that's showing that you're not right. All the sin, all the hate, all the unrighteousness. He says, but I can make a difference. I was amazed when I looked at the other song that I quoted to you, and I'm going to quote one more song, which some of you will appreciate and some will not. But they're written by the same guy, and I didn't know that. Is thy heart right with God, and are you washed with the blood, written by the same man, Elisha Hoffman, in the late 1800s? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? See, one question I ask, is our heart right? And the answer is no. <laughs> and the other one points us to how to get it right. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Will your soul be ready for your mansion bright? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Will be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? Has the blood of Jesus been applied to your sinful heart and life? I grew up in a church singing gospel songs, but I also went to youth group when I was older. I said I quoted the last one. This one's extra. This one's just for free, Brother Bill. We'd go to youth group down at the beach or somewhere like that, and they'd teach us silly songs with hand motions. I didn't grow up learning songs with hand motions. A gospel song, you got to have a book. you got to sing four parts. Youth songs, you get to all sing the same notes and you get to do hand motions. Spring up, oh well. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison's doors and sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. And then it would go, spring up, oh well. And we'd jump out of our seats and we'd go, goosh, 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 goosh. Some of y'all won't remember anything in the sermon except for that. Spring up, oh well. See, in 2020, with hindsight, some of us have to admit most of what sloshed out of us was rotten, filthy, fit for the outhouse. In 2021, what Jesus wants to come out of us is a pure river of life and goodness, his grace and mercy. But the only way to change that is for let Jesus do heart surgery. Let him give you his blood transfusion into your heart. Let his spirit come and save you and let you be born again from the inside outward. See, Jesus gives us a very clear understanding of what true and proper washing is. The nature of clean living is a clean heart given to us by God that comes out on the outside. I want to ask you that question. Do you understand the danger of the unwashed heart? Dying in your sin without Jesus. Standing before him. You won't be able to give him your prescription list. You won't be able to tell him about the 14 specialists that you went to every month and how they tried to keep you well. You will not be able to tell him about the tragic accident that ended your life without notice. What he will want to know is how is your heart? Has it been made clean? Are you well spiritually? That's the question of eternity. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and stand to your feet as we have a hymn of invitation. Lord, we ask you this evening, this afternoon, Lord, to speak to us. God, we thank you for liberty to preach today. Thank you for your people who have assembled at home and in the parking lot and in this, your physical church building. But God, we are your church, and you spoke to the lost, and you spoke to Peter, and each one had a word, do you understand? God, I pray that no one leaves here today not understanding. The most important issue in their life is their heart, and Lord, if there's a lost person here, we pray that they would be saved this morning. God, we pray that for the Christian that has wandered away and drifted in 2020, been inundated and overwhelmed with so many statistics and facts and procedures and protocols that they've been numbed to the seriousness of every moment of this life, live for you. God, that you would give us grace in this moment to respond based on your Holy Spirit for salvation, for repentance, for encouragement, for being built up. Whatever you're calling us to do, Lord, that we would do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You come right where you are in this moment, at home, in your parking lot, right here, wherever you are. You respond to the Lord and surrender all to him this morning.
all God's people said amen. amen. It's been great to be with you in the Lord's house today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being uh, the people God has called you to be. Uh, I'd like to remind you to be here tonight in the Lord's house. We'll have our church conference meeting uh, at 5 o'clock. And immediately following that, we'll have our ladies will meet. And uh, then the men will meet at the same time. The ladies meet in here. The men meet in the fellowship hall. And I know the men are supposed to be planning a spring outreach, uh, maybe a wild game supper, something. Our discussion over the last month was that the devil would have us do nothing and the Lord would have us do something. And so we're going to try by faith to plan on something we can do to, to be reaching out by March, somewhere in there, as we would normally do a wild game supper, and that may be what it'd be. Uh, it may be different, and that's okay. Different's fine in 2021. Uh, we just want it to be what God would have it to be, and we believe we ought to be reaching out, trying to be salt and light, pointing others to a, a reality that Jesus can make us clean. So come be a part of that, and we're going to have worship after that at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a wonderful time in the Lord's house. Wednesday will be a, a restart to our Wednesday services. We've taken a couple weeks off, but we'll be having regular Wednesday services this coming Wednesday. The following Wednesday, uh, we are going to be having uh, Todd and Kim Smith will be here. That I think it's the 13th, but anyway, it's the second Wednesday in uh, January, and they are missionaries in Zambia. They're here right now. Uh, Todd will be meeting with the men. We'll divide the group up to make it uh, more manageable. The men will probably meet in here with Todd and uh, and the boys. And then the girls and the ladies will meet with Kim in the other building, or it may be the other way around, but it'll be fine whichever way it is. Uh, if you have not been back on Wednesdays, we normally have great opportunity for you to have plenty of space, plenty of freedom. The ladies meet in here in a Bible study on Wednesdays. The men meet in the older fellowship hall. There's plenty of space for social distancing and those opportunities. And so come be a part of that. And uh, we're looking forward to renewing our Wednesday uh, worship and outreach. Uh, Lottie Moon offering so far is nearing our total. If you've not finished your giving, go ahead and wrap that up. Give till it feels right. Maybe you did give and you're still not satisfied. You gave like you should. Remember, you can finish that up anytime now. And uh, we're nearing the end of our Lottie Moon Christmas offering and we're almost at the goal. Uh, does anyone else have an announcement before I say something about the Devo Hub? Uh, Devo Hub, which is on the screen right now, is a devotional app on your phone, okay? Uh, most of us are wed to our phones, and we use them for everything. Uh, this is a devotion. The church, through the years, has purchased devotional books, and we still do for some people, just say, I just don't want it on my phone. But this is much more economical for the church, which wouldn't matter unless, unless it's available and, and efficient for you, okay? That's the main thing. But if this is good for you, that's how you download it, okay? And uh, there is a download opportunity there, and the church pays for that. You're not charged anything. We don't pay any more based on how many of you there are, so it's great and efficient for the church. And you can, Brother Fred always likes to read Journey, Stand Firm, Open Windows, all the stuff for all the ages and all the genders, he is an equal opportunity devotional reader. He always tells me that. Uh, and so if you want to read them all, you can read everything from the, the youth. You can even, anyway, there, there are about six of them up there. I can't read them all. This one in Spanish. If you're, even if you're not bilingual, you can learn Spanish. So uh, there's all sorts of opportunities there, and it's just easy. So if you need help with it, I just said it was easy, but don't ask me. Ask, uh, ask Rodney or Michael. They'll, they'll help make it easy for you. All right? If everyone's heart and mind's clear know this, even with a mask on, you're beautiful. Behind that mask is the beautiful you, and the Lord loves you, and you are his bride. You've been washed and made clean, and don't apologize for who he's made you to be. You just live for him in 2021. From my family to your, yours, happy new year. We love you. May God bless you and keep you, and we'll see you back in the Lord's house tonight or until we meet again. Love you. <laughs>